worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to St. John's Church Online. A uh, special welcome if you're here joining us for the first time. Uh, but let's see who's here. Uh, Sarah, you were first on my iPad today, so good evening to you. Uh, quickly followed by Mark. And then Caroline, and I have Don. Don, I don't believe we've met, but great to have you with us. Uh, and Chris is here too, and Moira, and anybody else. If I've not mentioned your name and you're tuning in, then if you just post a message down at the bottom of the thread here, then we'll know that you're connecting with us live. Uh, there will be some others, I'm sure, in a few minutes. It's sort of uh, the audience participation sort of picks up as we as we go on through the notices and into the opening worship. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry we were a bit late tonight. We had technical problems, uh, and then uh, the Vicarage washer has broken as well. So that's <laughs> that's slightly <laughs> uh, distracted me too. Uh, but not not to, to worry. We're we're here now to uh, to worship God and to meet around His Word and His presence, and uh, it's good to be together. Okay, let me do the Saint John's Church notices. Okay, so just to remind you, each week at St. John's on a Wednesday, we have a short act of worship at midday, midweek, midday prayer, just for about 30 minutes or so, uh, a song, uh, some readings, but primarily opportunity to pray for the world and for the church and for ourselves. Uh, so we're meeting again this Wednesday for that. Right, Christmas. Well, the government keep changing the situation, don't they? what they expect. But at the moment, uh, we're all good to go ahead. Uh, so this is what we have planned for our, our Christmas programme at St John's. Next Sunday morning, our services will run as normal at 9.30 and 11 o'clock. We will sing some carols in those services. But then at 6 o'clock in the evening, we will have our proper carol service, uh, which will be a little bit shorter than usual. Uh, it probably will be quite full, uh, so we can't offer any socially distanced seating for that event. Um, but we are encouraging people to wear masks. It is a legal requirement uh, in this country now uh, for the time being. Uh, we won't be having coffee and mince pies afterwards squashed into the hall because we felt that that would probably be a real super spreader um, moment. Uh, but the service, uh, we, we're fairly well spaced out anyway because of the pews and we'll be wearing masks. So we shall meet together, we shall remember the Christmas story, we shall sing carols. There'll be a message, there'll be a great time. Do join us if you're in the locality. Now on Christmas Eve, uh, we have our Chris Dingle services. And you can see the times there, 2.30, 15, 6 o'clock. You need to book in for these. Uh, in the past, we've had like 250 people squashed into the building and we can't allow that to happen at the moment. So we're having three services uh, and you need to book into uh, into one of those. And if you go to our church Facebook page or to the church website, www.stjohnsheden.org, uh, you'll see a link there which will take you to a booking system. And uh, you don't need to pay, you just need to register. And by doing that, we hope to spread uh, the numbers across the three services. There is Midnight Communion, 
uh, at 11.30 on Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day, we will have an act of all-age worship at 10 o'clock. Uh, now, we sat with... Uh, Christmas Eve being uh, with Christmas being on a Saturday, that means the day after, uh, which is Boxing Day, is Sunday, and we will have a service. Uh, I won't be doing it. I shall be on holiday by then, uh, but our cure Car Caroline will be doing it, and uh, I'm sure some of you will want to come to that. Um, so that will be at 9:30 service of Holy Communion. Sorry, it's not on the slide, but I couldn't fit it on. Um, so there we go. That's what's happening for Christmas. I should say for you are online worshippers, tonight's service is the last online worship for two weeks. So there won't be one next Sunday because we're doing the carol service. And there won't be one the following Sunday because it's Boxing Day. But then the first Sunday in January, we should be back with you at the same time, same place. OK, I hope that's all uh, straightforward. Uh, let me see who else has come. Uh, David is watching. David Bottrell and David David, Two Davids. Welcome to you both. And uh, Mark says, have a lovely holiday, Richard. Well, I will need it <laughs> by the time we've done the services. Uh, usually I just crash out on Boxing Day. But anyway. I think that's it, notice-wise. So let's begin this time. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Uh, so do join in wherever you are with the words in yellow. Uh, now, I don't have an Advent wreath with me here, but we're going to light the Advent candle virtually <laughs> by means of a picture. And uh, the different candles represent different people or different groups of people who look forward to the coming Messiah. So candle one, uh, we remember the patriarchs, uh, Abraham and Sarah and uh, all the others who from a distance saw that one day the Messiah was going to come and bless the world. And then the second candle reminds us of the prophets who um, looked with greater accuracy towards this person who would be born in Bethlehem, who would be a great ruler who would change the world. And then the third candle, we think of John the Baptist. So let's put that on the screen. There we go. So, so we've just lit our third candle there. John the Baptist, of course, born just a little bit before Jesus, began his ministry just a little bit before Jesus. And his, his big calling was to prepare people for the coming Messiah, get them ready to receive all that God was going to do through him. And that's what our message and our service is about tonight. So here's a prayer uh, based around the ministry of John the Baptist. God our Father, you gave to Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age a son called John. He grew up strong in spirit, prepared the people for the coming of the Lord and baptised them in the Jordan to wash away their sins. Help us, who have been baptised into Christ, to be ready to welcome him into our hearts and to grow strong in faith by the power of the Spirit. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world. So we're going to sing a couple of songs now. I've just noticed on my iPad as I watch the service that we seem to be having subtitles coming up. Uh, have you got them coming up on your computers or iPads, phones? Um, I haven't planned it to do that, but it seems to be coming up. So if you can see subtitles as I speak, then do let me know. And uh, if you find it helpful, then we'll stick with it. If not, then I'll think of a way in which we can get rid of them. But anyway, for now, we're going to sing two songs of worship. Firstly, a traditional hymn uh, and then a, a modern song. On Jordan's Bank, the Baptists cry.
So we come now to bring before the Lord any sense of failure, any awareness of sin we have in our lives. And we do that knowing that because of Jesus, that his forgiveness freely flows to us. So when the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Let's take a moment of quiet before we bring our confessions to God. Therefore, in the light of Christ, we confess our sins. Together, God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus, who died for us, forgive us for all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. So may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. So we come now to our two Bible readings. Here's the first one. From Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is a gospel reading. Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, about the ministry of John the Baptist. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. 
The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So two very challenging and exciting readings and I'm going to share some thoughts on them uh, in just a moment. But before we do that, we're going to sing again, Purify My Heart, as we prepare our hearts to listen and receive God's word. Purify My Heart. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold, refine as My heart's one desire. Is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do. from within and make me holy. Purify my heart, cleanse me from my sin. Deep within, refine as far. My heart's one desire is to be So the theme for tonight's message is prepare to be blessed. People ring the vicarage for all kinds of reasons. Maybe to request a christening for a, a new baby or to set a date for a wedding or to ask for help with a pastoral concern or maybe the ringing for guidance about some church ministry or some aspect of church life or perhaps they want to make a booking for the church hall there's all sorts of reasons why people ring the vicarage but on Thursday morning this week I had a most unexpected request I picked up the phone and the voice on the other end said as usual at this time of the week I'd like to put in a request for six pieces of chicken 
Well, bread and wine I can provide, but chicken is not something that vicars are usually expected to supply. But I quickly guessed what had happened. The caller was actually a, a church member, Alison, who I recognised. And thinking she was calling the butcher, she accidentally dialed my number uh, instead. Presumably they were next to each other on her speed dial. Well, it's easily done, isn't it? Dialing the wrong number and asking the wrong person for what we need. When it comes to food orders, it's not really a problem. But when it comes to bigger issues, to life and death issues, then it is. And it seems to me that a great many people in the world go through life looking to the wrong people or the wrong resources to meet their truest and deepest needs, when really they should be looking to God. And in our two Bible readings today, we heard of two of God's prophets who both called people to turn away from foreign gods and false hopes, wayward lifestyles and wrong phone numbers, if you like, and to turn wholeheartedly back to God, to God who was about to break into the world to save them and bless them. So I hope this word encourages you as we have a, a closer look at these two people. So first of all, John the Baptist's promise of blessing. Now, it's easy to misunderstand John's message. Yes, he was a bit of a way out guy. He was a fiery prophet who warned people of the coming day of God's judgment. But he wasn't really a prophet of doom. He also spoke a great deal about God's coming blessings. For example, John said that God was coming to bring salvation very soon to those who want it. He said God's forgiveness is freely available. He said God's Messiah was about to appear, the long-awaited Saviour. And he said that God's people would then be baptised with God's very living presence. So John said lots of positive stuff too. And Luke sums it all up by saying this in chapter 3, verse 18. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. You see, John's passion was to make sure that his people didn't miss out on all, on all of this, all of this blessing. He wanted people to, to take their eyes off the false hopes of this world and to turn away from the sinful distractions of this world and to place their eyes on God, who was coming in his love to rescue them. And we need to fix our eyes on him too. Now what about the prophet Zephaniah? Because he promised a time of blessing too. The prophet Zephaniah lived about 600 years before the time of Jesus and he did his work, his ministry, during the reign of King Josiah of Judah, warning God's people of great judgments that were coming on them and ultimately on the whole world. And yet at the end of his prophecy, and his book is very short actually, it's, it's only three chapters, at the end, Zephaniah speaks of God's promise to come and visit those who remain faithful and devoted to God and to bring great blessing to them. So let's listen to these beautiful words again right now. Because God, our God, doesn't change. The love he showed to his faithful people then is the same love he expresses towards us today. So this is from Zephaniah 3, 17. It says, The Lord your God is with you. How about that? He's not far off from you, my brother and sister. He's very close to you. He surrounds you. He lives inside you. You are not alone. And then Zephaniah says, The mighty warrior who saves... That's what he calls God. This God who is with you fights for you on your behalf. He fights against everything that grinds you down and destroys your life. The Lord comes to defeat all the evil forces at work in your life. That's who he is. And then it says this. He will take 
great delight in you. Think about that. He will take great delight in you. You see, the Lord doesn't just put up with us in the way that we might make allowances for someone we don't like very much, but we, we feel obliged to be nice to them. No, God looks at each one of his children and he feels delight in his heart towards them, towards you, even towards me. And in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. That's the next part of this beautiful section of Zephaniah. What an amazing statement. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, in everyday life, where do you see people singing over other people? I can think of two places. Firstly, a parent holding a baby in their arms, or a young child in their arms, full of love and joy, singing over them. Some of you might have even done that uh, in your own experience with your children. Secondly, somebody who's in love singing about their beloved. And popular music has many, many examples of that. And the Bible says that God's heart is so full of love and joy towards his people that he bursts into song when he's with them, when he's with us, when he's with you. Isn't that amazing? So let me ask you, is that how you imagine God feels about you? Getting really close to you, fighting on behalf of you, taking great delight, delight in you and singing with joy over you. Wow! Is that how you see God? Is that how you see his love for you? Do you see God as John the Baptist did, as the one who truly loves his people and who he wants to break into their lives today? He's coming right now at any moment to rescue you through Jesus. So these two prophets point us to the loving desire of God. Now I don't know about you, but I find that all kinds of doubts and questions and negative feelings can well up in my mind and my heart when I read passages of the Bible like these. It just seems too much that God would love me in that way. You say, I don't love myself that much, so why should he? Why would he? But God's word is true. And this is what God is really like. He loves us so much that when he thinks of us, he bursts into song. Therefore, what we need to do is to kind of wrestle our doubts into submission and to retrain our minds until we find that we can believe this. It's so very, very important that we learn to do this, actually. Important for our faith, important for our happiness, important for our health, body, soul and spirit, that we learn to see God in these ways. Earlier this year, I read a book by a Christian neuroscientist called Dr. Caroline Leaf. Uh, she does research on therapy, on and therapy on how our brains can be rewired so that what she calls toxic patterns of thought that we all naturally have and we, we know what she means don't we so those toxic patterns of thought are replaced by healthy patterns of thought and she recommends a daily uh, process of brain training that's quite similar actually to cognitive behavior therapy CBT which is often recommended these days, isn't it, for people who are struggling with their mental health. And Dr. Leaf has found that it takes 21 days to establish a new positive thought in your brain. And then another two lots of 21 days, so 63 days in total, to so establish that new pattern of thinking that it becomes normal for us on an ongoing basis. Now that's modern science, but the ancient spiritual writers 
Well, they recommended the same practices as well, except they called it biblical meditation. And if you want to truly believe that God really, really loves you and wants to break into your life to rescue you, then you need to focus your mind on these ideas every day. You need to read verses from the Bible that speak of God's love and think about them, ponder them, meditate upon them, and read them over and over again, memorize them, uh, until they take over your thinking and become established in your brain. Now, in addition to believing God's promises of love and blessing, the prophets also exhorted their people to prepare their hearts for what God was going to do. So let's now think a little bit about that. So firstly, Zephaniah's exhortation to prepare your hearts. Now, it's not in the passage that we had read today, but in chapter 2, Zephaniah says this, Seek the Lord. All you humble of the land, you who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying a day of judgment is coming, but get your hearts right with God, and instead of judgment, you'll receive blessing. The kind of blessings that we then read about in chapter 3 of Zephaniah. What about John the Baptist? Let's have a look at John the Baptist's exhortation to prepare your hearts. Well, of course, this is the main message, isn't it, of John the Baptist. Get your hearts right and get your lives ready. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. We know those words well, don't we, from Luke 3. Uh, verse 4. John offered people a baptism of repentance, an opportunity to publicly declare that they were turning away from themselves and they were turning back to God. They were going to stop dialing the wrong number to get their needs met and look instead to God and the Messiah to come and rescue them. And John could be very practical in his advice. He said, God is coming to chop down the tree of your life. That's effectively what he said. Unless you start producing good fruit. In other words, you all need to do some pretty serious repenting of your sins. And quickly. That was part of his message. It's what people had to do to prepare their hearts. And when people asked him what his message meant in their personal circumstances... Then he said very practical things too. He said that everyone should make efforts to care for the poor. And those who had power and authority in society, like the tax collectors and the soldiers, they should exercise their roles with honesty, integrity and fairness. Well, makes you wonder what John might say to some of our leaders today in government. But we won't dwell on that. I wonder what he might say though to you and to me. And yet John wasn't out to crush people. He just wanted to make sure that people didn't miss out on the great blessings that God was about to release in their midst. The blessings we now know came about through Jesus. Jesus the Messiah. So as we look forward to celebrating the coming of Jesus at Christmas, and as we look forward to the beginning of a new year, this is a great time for us to prepare our hearts for the blessings that God wants to bestow on us. So as I finish, I'd like to recommend a practice. It's a practice that I've used on an occasional basis in my relationship with God for many, many years now. I actually learnt it from the Reverend Colin Urquhart. Uh, you might or might not have heard of him. He was a, a godly and spiritual preacher and church leader who went to be with the Lord this, this year. Here's the practice. Get a sheet of A4 paper and fold it into three. And on one side, at the top of the three sections, write the words sins, hurts and fears. On the other side, at the top of the three sections, write the words possessions, 
abilities and hopes. And then go somewhere quiet with your piece of paper and a pen and ask God to bring to mind everything in each category that he wants you to give over to him. And then write down any thoughts you have. And then pray through those lists that you've made. And it might take a while for you to do this. But your heart will be in a much better place with God by the end. You'll feel a sense of cleanness and newness and openness to God. I commend that practice, the practice of a spiritual inventory to you. Let me conclude this message with some words from one of my favourite spiritual writers, A.W. Tozer. And he wrote this. The Lord cannot fully bless a person until he has first conquered them. Let me say it again. The Lord cannot fully bless a person until he has first conquered them. And it's as we learn to prepare our hearts to meet with God, to turn from wrong numbers and wrong ways back to him, so he's able to pour out upon us all those blessings that in his love he so desires to give to us. Amen. Uh, so let's take those thoughts into prayer now, shall we? Right, just get yourself uh, quiet in the room where you are, get yourself seated, close your eyes, maybe put your hands out in front of you and we'll take a few moments to pray through the contents of that message and then we'll pray for the world and for those who are not uh, so well at the moment. So let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you are so good to us, that you love us in this incredible way, and your desire is to rescue us, to break through into our lives and to save us. And you've already done that through Jesus, and you come afresh to do it by your Holy Spirit into the different circumstances uh, that we face in life. Thank you, God, for your love for us. But Lord, we confess that very often we turn away from you. We are distracted by the issues of this world. We look for other things and other people to solve our problems instead of looking to you. And Lord, we so, are so often led astray by wrong desires and priorities. And we ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. Lord, would you help us in these days to prepare our hearts to come afresh to you, to open our lives afresh to you for a deep and uh, renewing work of your Holy Spirit. Even as we go through this Christmas season and into the new year, Lord, help us to go ever deeper with you. Show us, God, the things in our lives that are getting in the way of us knowing you and loving you and serving you and give us the desire and the strength by your spirit to lay those things to one side and to open our hearts more fully to you and as we do that dear lord would you bring us into a, a greater time of personal renewal in the spirit a greater time of revival in your power and your grace so, Lord, lead us forward, we pray. Help us to prepare our hearts so that you might indeed pour upon us your wonderful blessings. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's pray for our friends in America following those awful uh, tornadoes. You see, just pictures of devastation on our TV screens on the news and so Lord we pray for all those people who are affected by those tornadoes people who have lost family and friends who have lost homes and places of work and possessions and all of that Lord we pray for those 
who are still alive in the rubble. Lord, we ask that they might be found, that you would help them, that you would send people to rescue them. We ask for your grace and your strength for grieving people. We ask for your healing for those who are in hospital recovering. We ask God for your peace for those who are traumatised by what has happened. The Lord, strengthen your churches in those areas that they might represent you well in the things they say and do and the help they provide. So we pray for your blessing, your healing, your presence, Lord, in that situation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray for our own country with all the concerns about the Omicron variant of COVID. Father, we pray that you would guide our government and its advisors to do that which would be most helpful for people at this time. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us soon through this time to, to better times times of greater freedom, less anxiety about these viruses. And bless us, Lord, as we gather as churches uh, over this Christmas period. Renew our faith. And Lord, may many who haven't been coming to church for years, may they be gathered at Christmas to hear the good news message of Jesus. May seeds of the gospel be sown in their hearts that will be reaped as a harvest in the future. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we pray for those known to us who are ill? I'm going to pray for those on our notice sheet, um, people in the St. John's congregation. So Lord, we pray for Mavis and Anita Keith and Susan Smalley and Helen Page Pray for David McDowell and Emily and Alan and Pauline, Pauline and Ray, for David and Christina, for Steve Amos and for Barbara Farrah, whose husband sadly passed away this week. Lord, we lift all of these people to you, knowing that you love them, knowing that your desire is to save them and to rescue them. And so, Father God, we pray that you will meet them at their point of need. Father, give them the healing they need for their bodies and minds and emotions. Give them the peace that they seek. Strengthen them, Lord, in the circumstances that they are facing. And help them, Lord, most of all, to know your wonderful presence with them. And we pray this too, in the name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. And so gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so now as our service draws to an end, we're going to sing Worthy of Every Song.
Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to Tim, Liz, Anita, Zoe and Daniel for helping us with our song Worship 2. Uh, just looking through the uh, the messages you've sent, uh, Don Moz. <laughs> yes, if you're still there, Don, Don, you're Don, isn't it? Donna Smalley. I should have worked that out. Donna Mosley. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you for everybody else who's joined us. Um, hope you've been blessed as we've worshipped together and prayed together and I hope that message was an encouragement to your heart as well um, as I said at the start of the service uh, there's no online worship next week because we've got the carol service and no online worship the week after because it's Boxing Day but the first Sunday back in January will be here uh, at 7 o'clock to worship the Lord with you together so do join us for that and if I don't see you before, have a fantastic Christmas, whether it's excitement or peace or refreshment or relaxation or whatever it is that you need. Uh, may you have it this Christmas. May the Lord bless you in this uh, very special time of the year. So a, a blessing as we finish. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you. Scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Thy presence 